So good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to check in with my staff if I get a thumbs up that we should get started. All right, I've got that thumbs up. So uh, good afternoon. It's, it's great to have you all with us. And welcome to our first video meeting of our COVID response effort. Uh, I'm Mark Stewart. And uh, if it looks like I'm about seven weeks overdue for a haircut, I am. And uh, <laughs> this is about as disheveled as you will hopefully ever see me. Um, that is, of course, if we don't get back um, to some sense of new normal anytime soon. But we're really grateful to have our fund holders, board members, and staff with us today as we're pleased to share an update on the Foundation's focus on emergency response for the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. Uh, next slide, please. We have a, a great agenda uh, for you for our call today. And um, while we're gonna spend a considerable time talking about the San Diego COVID-19 Community Response Fund, we also wanna make sure to share some updates with you on our investments, as well as the new countywide loan program for small business and nonprofits. Next slide, please. I know we have all become Zoom pros over the last seven weeks, but I'd like to just go over a few functions to make sure we're all on the same page. So of course, please make sure to mute yourself in the lower left-hand corner of the Zoom screen so that we can have the best uh, telephony possible for this um, conference. And then also, if you've got any questions for us to make sure that we will address at the end of this video call, please go ahead and register your questions in the chat, which of course is also at the middle um, uh, control bar at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Next, please. And also, if you'd like to have a chance of, of seeing who's all with us, you can always go to the participants um, button, also on a lower uh, control bar. And then again, if you also have a question um, and uh, don't want to have to necessarily type it into the chat, you can feel free to raise your hand and we'll call on you at the end. And our Chief Development and Stewardship Officer, Brian Zambano, will be addressing questions. Um, and if you'll just give me one second. Sorry, a little background noise in my home, as I'm sure we are all uh, all living with being workers and residents and partners and teachers and parents all together. So uh, um, continuing on to the next screen, uh, I'm really pleased uh, to share with you in my very first, um, so this week I'm actually ending my first year with the San Diego Foundation. And I really count myself lucky for having an opportunity to work with such great colleagues. Uh, missing from this slide is Teresa Nakata, our Chief Communications and Marketing Officer. But um, your team of senior staff has been working so well together despite our physical distance. And we meet and talk just about every day on our COVID-19 response and efforts. And so it's again, a great privilege, privilege to have four of them on the call with you. And I'm sure in uh, future iterations of these updates, uh, Teresa will be joining as well. Next slide, please. And then why don't you go one more slide? I don't need to see myself. <laughs> Thanks. So um, our work on the San Diego COVID-19 Community Response Fund began in earnest on March 12th with calls to and from leaders around San Diego, as well as the Foundation's Board of Governors. Uh, early on, the San Diego uh, Gas and Electric was the very first institution and company to kind of mit a million dollars to this nascent uh, fund. And then your San Diego Foundation Board officers added another $300,000 that was previously dedicated to childhood nutrition, which uh, uh, is very appropriate for what we're trying to do with this fund. So next slide, please. So that weekend really became an all day Friday as we worked all weekend to coordinate 
pull together and work with partners with whom we hadn't worked closely before to come together with all the different priorities and deliverables so that we could have a great announcement of the fund on Monday, March 16th. And so it culminated in a wonderful announcement with uh, Supervisor Nathan Fletcher, Keith Maddox, who's the Executive Director of the Labor Councils of San Diego and Imperial County, AFL-CIO, and Nancy Sasaki, the CEO of the United Way. And as soon as we announced the fund, um, gifts began to pour in, especially from our fund holders. And I'm really pleased that also just two days later, our Board of Governors added almost a million dollars from discretionary funds to grow our COVID-19 totals. On the next slide. So we also knew that we did not want all the decisions for the COVID-19 Community Response Fund grants simply to be made by our staff from Liberty Station. So we developed a multifaceted Community Response Fund Leadership Council, and I'm really happy to introduce you to some of the community rock stars who have joined us in this effort. On the next slide. Thanks. So we have we developed a great uh, executive committee that meets weekly every Tuesday. And this group makes final decisions on grants of $100,000 or less with the San Diego Foundation's board uh, being the final deciders on grants above that limit. This group is really well connected to the community and are recognized leaders and pillars in our region. Okay. And they've also been great advisors and counselors to us uh, for the fund. Next, please. Likewise, we assembled a dedicated and wise team to evaluate and initially approve new grants every week. So this group meets on Mondays, our uh, executive committee meets on Tuesdays, and then by Thursday, uh, we're able to begin moving these grants out uh, into the community. Next page. We've also recently launched our efforts on creating a San Diego County Small Business and Nonprofit Loan Program. And I'll leave the description of the work of this group to our CFO, Jim Howell, who's really been leading this uh, effort and, and doing it so very well. Next page, please. As well, Brian Zambano, um, who will present later on this call, will also talk about this uh, great group of people that we've assembled to help us on the fundraising, which has, has grown to a, a sum much greater than what I think any of us initially anticipated. Next slide. And then finally, uh, Teresa Nakata oversees our communications committee, and we've developed a wonderful partnerships um, out of this effort that I'll describe just a little bit later. So now to get you to some numbers. And what I'm really um, so pleased to share is that the total gifts that have come into the Community Response Fund are more than $10 million. We have new gifts and commitments coming in every single day. Uh, it's my anticipation that we are well on the way to growing the fund to $15 million. And I'll, I'll share with you, we really have no goal for the fund. Our effort is to make sure to raise as much money to do as much good in our community as we possibly can. And also, um, the, the, the note at the bottom of that slide is also very important uh, to share with you, is that as a part of the commitment by the San Diego Foundation and our Board of Governors, uh, we're taking absolutely no uh, fees or, or any discounts to support our organization based upon the uh, private contributions that have come in. So we're making sure that every dollar that comes into the San Diego Foundation uh, can go out as quickly as possible. Next slide, please. Thanks. So this great work could not be done without some really devoted philanthropic partners. What is uh, remarkable about this slide in particular is that about one third of all the commitments that have come from our corporate donations, which is really unprecedented in the United States when almost all philanthropy is overwhelmingly committed by individuals. Next slide, please. And some of the leading uh, contributions that we have had um, have also come from 
fantastic fund holders at the San Diego Foundation. Uh, the Hervey Family Fund were one of the very first uh, donors to come in at a million dollars. And then the Herveys have added even more to their contribution to this fund. And I'm sure Brian Zambano will talk more about that. But um, our staff of really dedicated uh, development and stewardship um, colleagues to our fund holders began to immediately reach out to um, our fund holders to see what they might like to do. And while I won't name names, I was really um, touched when uh, Brian Zambano reported to me that one of our fund holders, when uh, the fund was described to her, she said, just empty my donor advised fund. And um, Brian and team advised her, you know, let's leave a little bit of money in there to keep the fund open. But they, they had 95% of all the funds uh, th that were in their account, they emptied to have come to this um, COVID-19 response. And it was just really gratifying to know of that level of commitment. And so you can see many of the uh, significant leadership donors who have come to this effort. Next slide, please. The other one that I really want to um, highlight is um, some of our incredible media partners. So uh, first and foremost, uh, as soon as we launched the fund, we immediately heard from KFMB CBS uh, 8 that they would like to join us as a media partner. And I can tell you, they have been ever present, ever ready, and a constant uh, uh, partner to us in this effort. There is no way that the San Diego Foundation could ever have afforded to pay for the incredible programming that News 8 has made uh, available to us. And so it's, they've just been uh, incredible in that capacity. And then we also engaged uh, media advisors and creative consultants, 62 above, who have really helped us uh, develop our Better Together campaign. And hopefully as you've either read the Union Tribune or you've seen some of our online ads or you watched the special that was on CBS 8 last week, you got to see some of the very outstanding work that 62 Above contributed to this effort. And while they were a paid partner for us, they've given us so much more value than um, uh, what we could have, again, ever afforded to do with them. And so um, let, let me um, turn now to um, Connie Matsui, who has served as the interim uh, chief executive officer when the foundation was between CEOs. She's been board chair. Um, Connie is also, as we're look, uh, searching and wrapping up our efforts to attract a chief impact officer to the foundation, she's been serving in that capacity too. And I, I could not have uh, uh, all of her time to us as Connie has. So Connie, all yours. Thank you so much, Mark, and uh, warm greetings to all of you joining this webinar. I, I saw some familiar names and uh, really happy to have you join us today. So as, as Mark says, um, it, this has been an extraordinary privilege to work on granting out a, an unprecedented amount of money to uh, meet the needs of San Diego during this crisis. Um, we've tried to do so with a tremendous amount of um, responsibility, sense of responsibility, as well as urgency, but also uh, with a huge sense of gratitude to our initial donors who specified um, where to give the first grants, but also to so many who have joined those donors along the way. We, we've also been indebted to a number of advisors and um, uh, contacts who have shared their knowledge and expertise and so we can go to the next slide and they have helped us to uh, disperse um, seven million dollars in grants the bulk of which are going still to essential needs uh, such as food security and help with rent um, uh, hygiene supplies um, any kind of uh, need financially related to loss of income. Uh, they, we do have more grants in the pipeline. We've got a, we've got a great team, Lydia Van Note, Michelle Jaramillo and Katie Rast have been doing 
their usual program management jobs and, and uh, adding on a tremendous, tremendous effort to uh, expand our reach through these COVID-19 grants. Um, and we, we also have a great many more uh, to evaluate and to, um, to respond to. Uh, so the, the word has gotten out uh, to many people and many nonprofits in need. And so we are continuing with this work. So, so to give you an overview of where this money has gone, we have a pie chart coming up on the next slide. Uh, and um, again, not surprisingly, uh, the bulk of the money has gone to direct financial need, um, whether it's, again, health care, uh, rent, food, um, uh, school supplies. The, uh, the next major category is food security, as you can see, and, and that's, an, a, frankly, a never-ending need that we're seeing. Um, and then we've also made sure that we pay attention to emerging needs. And one of the ones that um, popped up soon after schools was closed was the lack of access to uh, ongoing school programming because of the um, absence of computers in many, many homes, um, in many places where uh, school children live. So our clear priorities have been, again, to meet essential needs, but also to be attentive to trends that we're hearing from the nonprofits and the community members we've been in touch with. Um, what you might ask, you know, what do we see around the corner? Uh, we, we do believe that the ongoing need for food and financial assistance um, will be concerns about isolated communities, about families at risk, um, whether to, because of domestic violence or again, loss of income and as well as a much more increased need for mental health and behavioral health services. So in our future grants, you may start to see those trends. So next slide, just to do a little bit of a walk down memory lane. Uh, one of our first grants was to Child Development Associates and YMCA of San Diego County uh, to bolster their services to first responders and medical workers who were uh, really scrambling for childcare, especially when their own time and expertise was in such great demand. We actually partnered with uh, San Diego for Every Child in order to pull this grant together. Um, and that you'll hear as I go on to describe some of our other grants, that partnering with other funders, with other um, experts, other networks, has been a hallmark of how we're approaching this grant making. So the next slide uh, gives you an overview of a very significant amount of money that we have contributed to trying to bridge the digital divide. And initially, the focus has been on increasing the supply of computers and laptops, uh, Chromebooks, uh, to college students as well as K through 12 students. So as an example, uh, Computer to Kids, uh, the $175,000 there was used to refurbish, is being used to refurbish 20,000 computers that are being offered uh, and distributed to um, uh, families uh, at, a, at a much reduced price. I think it's somewhere in the order of $200, if not less. So it's really making a um, transformational change in terms of their connectivity and their ability to stay up with their schoolwork. We also, as you see, made a half a million dollar grant to the community college district for um, purchase of computers and laptops. So again, what we, what we see around the corner, and it's actually uh, something we're working on right now, is now that people have the hardware, there's increasing difficulty in terms of accessing the internet. Um, the areas that have been underserved by the internet are more glaring than before. And so we have um, a partnership with Illumina, with uh, San Diego Unified Classrooms of the Future, and um, with the County Office of Education to try to, un to, to um, understand uh, the depth of the need for connectivity um, to the internet 
uh, and to try to sustain that over at least the next six months. So the next page is a, a quite a long list of all of our NPO partners, all of our nonprofit partners who have a reputation for really listening to the needs of the community and being able to responsibly distribute funds, cash funds, grocery cards, um, financial assistance to the people in need. And um, if you scan just some of the names, you'll see that we have a cross section of ages, populations, and um, employees. Uh, we have everything from uh, restaurant and hotel workers to homeless children, to artists, to foster youth, to immigrants, and to military uh, personnel on, on this list. And we, we, are, um, we are eager to continue to expand this list. Next page, uh, food security. Uh, some of these are um, well known uh, in terms of their leadership in meeting needs. Uh, uh, San Diego Food Bank, as well as uh, Feeding America, Feeding San Diego. But we also had the privilege of supporting Catholic charities in establishing 26 food pantries in the early weeks of the COVID-19 crisis. And so again, you'll see a diversity in terms of the populations that we, we want to and are committed to, to help. Next page, just one example of the type of medical support uh, we've been providing through our grants. And um, this one was quite touching and I know it meant a lot to Mark to uh, be in a, an interview with the chief medical officer at Tri-City who was so deeply grateful for the equipment that was purchased with this $100,000 to protect both the patients and the health workers um, in, in this crisis. Uh, we're, we've made more recent grants to um, uh, organizations like La Maestra uh, Family Clinic um, and others. Uh, and it, we're, now that we're seeing uh, the expansion of COVID-19 testing, uh, that's, that's where some of our support is going now to make sure that especially disadvantaged populations have access to COVID-19 uh, testing. And then finally, we have an overview of some of our partners in uh, providing this kind of critical assistance to so many people. Um, the 211, of course, uh, who responds to the urgent calls from people throughout the county. Um, another one that I think uh, is, is emblematic, of, again, of the reach that we are implementing through these grants is the San Diego Organizing Project at the bottom. Um, that is a, uh, a consortium of over 30 faith-based organizations, and so it's a wonderful way to get information out about how to get relief and assistance um, if, in, if people are in need of food or, or financial assistance or healthcare. So um, as, as we look down the road, we are thinking not only about how can we continue to address emergency assistance, but also how can we begin to think about building more capacity within these um, such within such dedicated uh, this the dedicated nonprofit community um, and so as we as we proceed we're going to be um, incorporating aspects of nonprofit capacity building in the types of grants uh, that we're looking at um, and also to work with them to see how they can be even more effective and sustainable uh, during the recovery from COVID-19. So I really appreciate this opportunity uh, to share the incredibly rewarding work uh, that we've been able to do on behalf of the foundation. And I'll uh, introduce Jim Howell, our chief financial officer, who's also been um, the leader in our impact investing, small business and nonprofit loan program. So Jim. Great, and um, thank you for that introduction and background on all the wonderful things in the grant making. 
space, Connie. At the San Diego Foundation, it is a real priority for us to deliver innovative grant making and funding solutions um, to the community and nonprofits in the San Diego region. So you heard all about grant making. Let me go ahead and tell you about the other funding programs, um, which is really labeled, this is a mouthful, but it's the San Diego COVID-19 Small Business and Nonprofit Loan Program. Um, for more information specific to that, um, it is available and there, there's an increasing web presence at San Diego SBNLP.org. Um, and, and really, um, we have just, um, we're just in the beginning stages. If you want to advance, um, advance the slide. I, I first want to start by recognizing um, what, what is truly a great coalition. I mean, in, in addition to the San Diego Foundation, it's taking many um, capital market partners um, with uh, mission-driven finance playing uh, a leading role, helping with uh, things like capital raising, deal structuring, servicing, compliance. Um, the CDFIs uh, locally, Axion and LISC San Diego, being able to provide um, transactions and underwriting directly to many small businesses in San Diego. Cal Southern that's providing uh, the ability um, for state um, guaranteed funding and, and particularly um, the San Diego uh, County, uh, all of the leaders, the Board of Supervisors on April 21st, uh, there was a minute order passed approving $5 million of funding specific uh, to this program. So that's really exciting. Um, in addition, on April 22nd, the San Diego Foundation Board of Governors dedicated another $5 million um, to a different portion of this program, um, but we're collectively over the $10 million mark with another $200,000 commitment from the Alliance Healthcare Foundation. So this is truly creating a unique investing opportunity in California. Uh, I think I've mentioned uh, the, the um, lower part of the state guarantee, the San Diego Foundation providing capital. So go ahead and advance to the next slide. Uh, I mentioned the website reference. Um, there's been um, really what I would say overwhelming um, demand so far. We intend to fulfill uh, absolutely as much lending capacity uh, as can be arranged. Um, with the $5 million investment by the San Diego Foundation Board of Governors, we intend to um, have a portion of that in subordinated loan funding. Um, that provides the ability for other lenders uh, to join. Those could be local banks, credit unions, uh, to lend in a senior position to make an even greater uh, impact. And, and I mentioned the County Board of Supervisors and their commitment, and I'll talk about the distinction between the two different uh, $5 million commitments. So the, the, the county structure is um, working in connection with Axion uh, to underwrite loans under $50,000 in the unincorporated regions uh, of San Diego County. Um, that um, we are in the process of finalizing all of the structural uh, aspects associated with that, we expect to, to wrap that portion uh, of it up within a week or two and really be ready for Axion uh, to be uh, sourcing and underwriting uh, applications from those small businesses and nonprofits uh, in unincorporated San Diego uh, by the end of May and funding loans uh, in June. Um, the, the $5 million piece from the San Diego Foundation is intended for loans over over $50,000 and across the broader San Diego um, region. Um, and, and again, we intend to find other banking partners to help. Um, so it really go ahead and turn it over uh, to me. Great, well, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, we obviously are in the midst of a large amount of volatility in the capital markets as a result of this COVID crisis. Really beginning in, in mid-February, um, equity markets around the globe uh, had a very sharp, severe decline, um, peaked a trough of, of greater than 30% in some cases. Um, and so as a result of this market volatility, um, you know, it, as risk takers, which we are, um, we take risk uh, commensurate with the level of return we expect for each of the portfolios we manage. 
we certainly weren't immune from participating in that downside um, that happened. Fortunately, we've had really unprecedented fiscal and monetary stimulus um, since about mid-March, and markets have rallied um, through mid-March into April um, and have now seemed to have stabilized um, a bit. We are expecting final results um, for the first quarter of the calendar year um, later today. Um, and so I don't have firm numbers to share with you today, uh, but I would invite you if you have greater interest in learning about our investments and getting a review on the first quarter to join us uh, for our June 3rd webinar, which will be dedicated uh, to an investment portfolio review for each of our portfolios. So Travis, if you go to the next page, what do we where do we go from here i think that's a big question that that everybody is asking and unfortunately the answer is very uncertain um, it's going to take time to really understand the true effects of covid 19 on the global economy and on the u.s economy we do know unemployment has spiked to unprecedented levels um, that will cause significant damage to our economy but at the same time, while you have kind of the downward uh, forces on the market of COVID-19, you, you have this, uh, this kind of opposite force coming from the Federal Reserve and other central banks, where it looks like the Federal Reserve is willing to do just about anything to avoid a large economic crisis. And so these two opposite forces have really led to some stability in the market. And it's, it's very uncertain as to where we go from here. But I think it is fair to say that volatility is likely to continue for the, the next several months until we have more certainty around this situation. So what are we doing? Myself, staff, and the investment committee um, are talking on a very frequent and regular basis. The first thing we're doing is we're maintaining our long-term perspective. and it, it's easy to say it's harder to do, but to give you an example, I can't tell you, and, and I don't think anyone can tell you what the markets will do tomorrow or over the next month or over the next three months. But with time, looking out three years, five years and beyond, I can tell you with some certainty uh, that we will recover from this. Um, and that markets will uh, continue that upward trajectory at some point. And so having time on your side is really one of the biggest advantages you can have as an investor. We're assessing our current investment managers. As you've heard me say on a regular basis, uh, where we think markets are efficient, we invest with, in, with inexpensive uh, passive managers. Where we think markets are less efficient, we invest with active managers. We have not had a bear market for 11 years, um, and the market has just gone up and up and up. And so this is a great time to really take a step back and look at the investment managers we're using, making sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, meeting our expectations, and not taking any undue risk. While we're long-term investors, we do recognize that there are certain times in the market where valuations are cheap and other times when valuations are more expensive. Um, we are working very diligently on identifying and capitalizing on market dislocations. It's been some time since we've had a major market dislocation, but oftentimes when you have one, there are certain areas of the market that become very cheap um, and investing at those times can lead to outsized risk adjusted returns. So we are seeking those opportunities as we speak. And then finally, we wanna be a capital provider when capital is scarce. The one thing we know over the last 11 years since the great financial crisis is that Capital has been abundant. And when capital is abundant, oftentimes valuations reach very stretched high levels. 
and future returns become less attractive. If we can step in in today's environment and provide capital where capital is scarce, perhaps other investors have liquidity problems, perhaps there's a lot of fear, we can get paid outsized returns again on a risk-adjusted basis by doing so. So that's our focus. Um, I'm going to ask uh, if you uh, if you want to learn more, certainly join us on our June 3rd webinar. In next page, please. I'll hand it over to Brian Zambano, our Chief Development and Stewardship Officer. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, if we could go to the next slide, it'll prompt me to some of the topics I'd like to cover and uh, let you all know a little bit about our fund and the fundraising aspects of it. And, you know, it's, I think, a sign of all the amazing philanthropic support we've seen, not only to our fund, but within our community. Um, earlier in, in this presentation, Mark quoted a number of $10.8 million in our fund. And as you can imagine, this, this slide deck was prepped only a couple days ago and updated as much as we could. But that number is already up to about $12.3 million just since this deck was finalized. Uh, Connie mentioned a $1 million contribution from Illumina, which was just announced last night as part of the mayor's daily briefing. And that contribution will help bridge the digital divide through providing internet access to students who don't have them. Um, so it's just been a wonderful outpouring of philanthropic support that we've seen. You know, Mark also mentioned the fantastic reaction and, and support we've seen from local corporations and companies, which is a little bit of an outlier for philanthropic giving. And um, our community has really responded that way with more than $4 million coming from companies in, in San Diego. And the other part that is really heartening to me is the way the fund holders of the San Diego Foundation have really stepped up um, with some significant giving, but also um, with a volume of giving. More than um, roughly four million, four and a half million dollars has come to our fund from San Diego Foundation fund holders, which is just a remarkable show of support from those of those fund holders who have trusted our organization for this time. And I know a few of you are on the call right now. I won't call anyone out by name, but you know who you are and thank you very much for what you do. Uh, I just want to cover a few things. First is the CARES Act. I know a lot of people have heard a lot about the stimulus bill, and I won't go into it too much. If you want any fun nighttime reading, I highly recommend digging into it. But I'll point out just a few things that are really related to charitable giving. Um, one of which is for those who don't itemize, you can now get a $300 charitable deduction just for 2020, though. So these things are just for this year's tax, uh, tax season. And what it's meant to do is really encourage giving. Um, that has to be with a, a cash contribution. And unfortunately for a DAF provider like San Diego Foundation, it doesn't count to a donor advised fund, but something like the COVID-19 Community Response Fund at the San Diego Foundation does count, as do things like our scholarship and environment programs or any nonprofit with a cash contribution. For those folks who do itemize, uh, previously they could deduct up to 60% of their adjusted gross income, their, their AGI. In 2020 only though, that number has uh, increased all the way up to a full 100% of your AGI. So again, it's just a way that um, the government and others are really trying to promote philanthropy now. And I think it's one of the reasons we're seeing such an outpouring of support. And it's great to see uh, individuals, corporate, government, everyone rallying together to see what we can do um, to really get more philanthropic dollars out the door to those nonprofits that are doing it. I think you heard from Connie, um, with what an amazing uh, nonprofit community we do have. And the more money we can get to them, the more good they can do. And then secondly here, um, we're thrilled to announce the Hervey Family Matching Gift Challenge. So as Mark mentioned, the Hervey Family was uh, a longtime fund holders for the San Diego Foundation, and were generous enough to contribute a million dollars at the start of the fund, um, and then just you know, could, couldn't help but do more. Um, because what an amazing philanthropic family they are. And they last week uh, launched a $1.5 million matching gift, dollar to dollar, to anyone who contributes to the COVID-19 Community Response Fund. Uh, I'm happy to announce that in just a week, we're about halfway to that $1.5 million match. So uh, if you are interested in taking advantage of it, please do. Time will be running out in a little bit, thanks to all the tremendous support we've seen. This is actually the third match we've gotten 
from fund holders at the San Diego Foundation. Uh, the first was from the Dr. Seuss Fund. Uh, the Dr. Seuss Foundation has had a fund with the San Diego Foundation for quite some time now and has been tremendously supportive and impactful in the San Diego community. And then after that, uh, we were able to leverage a $500,000 matching contribution from the Halajialu Family Foundation, another fund holder with the San Diego Foundation, both of which were met in, in great time as we're seeing with the Herbie one too. And it's just equally inspiring to see fund holders and other philanthropists uh, rallying others to do the same. And I know talking about large numbers and uh, for, for those of you thinking, well, I, you know, I can't do that and that's okay. Um, what we've also seen is a large volume of, of small gifts and they're not small, they might be small in number, but they're not small in impact. The more people give, uh, the more collectively we can support our community. So whether it's to the fund that we're, we're holding or, or some of your favorite nonprofits, um, you know, we would just encourage, give, give to your favorite charity. And, and if you do, now would be the time to really trust those nonprofits that you know so well to do the great work that they do. And we would suggest maybe just giving general operating support. I know we have the programs we care about, I do as well, um, but now's the time when nonprofits uh, need all the unrestricted funding that they can get to really carry on their mission in the way that they know how to and that we as donors and funders trust that they know how to. And ask others to join you. People are motivated to see others give. I mean, we, as I mentioned, we saw it with our matching gifts. And, you know, when your friend tells you they're doing it or you tell someone else, it inspires others. So if you have given, um, you know, it's not bragging to tell others. It's something, a, a source of pride. And know that it encourages others to do the same. So please ask others to join you. Also, a lot of people need help. And you know, we at the San Diego Foundation uh, know this quite acutely when we first launched our fund and ever since as well, we're receiving calls from individuals saying, I need help. Um, that is an unfortunate reality we're all dealing with our neighbors. Uh, they need a lot of help. And if someone asks, how can I get help personally? The fund at the San Diego Foundation grants to, as Connie mentioned, nonprofits on the front lines, not individuals. Uh, if individuals do need help, we suggest they go to the county and county resources or an organization called 211. They can also help um, point people in the right direction about what nonprofits and support services are out there. So please feel free. Any questions, you know, now is a great time to ask them. If you want to give, uh, the link is right there, sdfoundation.org backslash COVID-19. You can also see all of our grantees there, uh, the whole list of folks who have given to maybe inspire you to do so as well. And again, now's a great time to uh, realize a, a matching gift from the Hervey family. If you give a dollar, they will give a dollar as well. So you can double the contribution that you make. So um, please do visit. If you have any questions, you can also visit that site, uh, call our staff. We have um, folks on our end who can direct you in the right place and answer any questions you may have. And speaking of questions, I believe the next slide uh, is, is questions for anyone here. Um, please feel free uh, to use the chat function to ask any questions. Um, I see we have a couple already. And as we go through these, please ask more. We'll be able to, to go through them. And oh, Jim, you're up. So a uh, question about our loan fund. And I know we get a lot of these. So Jim, any, any, I know you touched on it a little bit, but for folks wondering, how do I apply? What's the timing when will dollars go out? Is, are there any details we might be able to share? Um, uh, yeah, yes, uh, you know, certainly, uh, Brian, uh, there are more details and they're being uh, updated uh, every week, um, you know, at San Diego SBNLP.org. Um, we, we do intend uh, to be uh, moving from a, a structural formation uh, phase of our activities to actual underwriting and funding of loans, um, principally in the June um, timeframe. So we, we have a few more efforts undergoing in May to kickstart the program, uh, but really June, July, uh, through the summer months, um, Axion, our loan committee, we will be very busy uh, funding organizations in, in San Diego. Great, thanks, Jim. Uh, let's see. Oh, um, any silver linings you have seen in the work you are doing? Uh, Connie, I know uh, something I always enjoy is uh, 
Connie has all these amazing stories of impact and working with all these uh, nonprofits. So uh, maybe if you don't mind, we'll, we'll start with you. Sure, thank you, thank you Brian. Um, I think that uh, some of you on, on the line uh, have been uh, supporters and volunteers, uh, employees of the San Diego Foundation for a number of years. And um, back when I first got involved with the uh, foundation through strategic planning, some of the things we were hearing were that nonprofits were frustrated that they didn't appear to have access to um, to grants uh, from the foundation and and the community was also telling us that they really craved an, a more authentic and widespread connection between you know their their community and and the foundation and I have to just share with you that that has all changed now because of the COVID nineteen community response fund. Uh, we are um, providing extraordinary access uh, to the um, uh, to the fund um, through an open application process. It's also a, a streamlined process to make it easy for uh, nonprofits to apply, and we have very light uh, reporting restrictions or re reporting requirements. Because again, we know that the nonprofits who are um, working so hard to address the needs of people during this COVID-19 crisis don't have time to go through a lot of paperwork and, and red tape. So what, what the, the fund has created for us is not only an opportunity to streamline and sort of humanize our grant making processes, it's also provided us with the opportunity for the community impact team members to learn from, speak with, um, uh, support uh, the, these nonprofits who are doing so much of the heavy lifting uh, during this time. So it's, it's been a growing experience. It's been an enlightening experience. Um, and I think that the uh, ways that we've made our work easier for our grantees uh, is going to persist and, and um, strengthen our relationships across the community. Connie, don't mute because you're up again with another question. Oh, oh, okay. This one from a, a very well-researched uh, participant who knows that we have 430 applicants with 33 million in current requests, which is true. Um, do you foresee still taking grant requests for urgent needs? Uh, yes, we, we actually do. Um, we, our process is to uh, look at grants on a rolling basis. So we've actually only declined formally a few uh, nonprofits up to now because uh, as more money comes in uh, it gives us the opportunity to um, broaden our criteria um, as well as remain nimble so for instance there may be grants that come in this week uh, that address a need that we might not have foreseen in in the first week so yes we are still taking grant requests Thank you, Connie. You know, we have about five minutes left and we do want to um, wrap with, with Mark one last time. Uh, if, you, if we didn't get to questions or if you have any more, again, please go to the website. There's um, a way to uh, either email us or call us. We're here to answer any questions you have. So thank you. And uh, with that, I will uh, send it back to Mark. Thanks, Brian. So first I want to give my thanks to Connie, Jim, Matt, and Brian for your efforts today and for being such dedicated ambassadors for the San Diego Foundation. Um, second, I also wanna give thanks for a great team of foundation colleagues and staff who've really made, worked hard to make today possible and to thank them for their efforts as well. While our building is closed and, and will remain closed for the foreseeable future, I hope you all know that your San Diego Foundation is open for business and we are working as hard and as collaboratively as we ever have. So reach out to us by phone, by email, by our website. If you've got any questions or concerns, we'll be happy to uh, work with you in any way that we possibly can. I also wanna give uh, great credit and thanks to our Board of Governors who have been with us as steadfast partners and leaders on the COVID-19 Community Response Fund since its very beginning. And the Board of Governors has approved grants 
and use of discretionary dollars, totaling $7.3 million between both our community response fund and our loan program. So they've been great leaders and I know they um, want to do as much as they possibly can to help our community. So lastly, I'll just close with, um, for any of you that have visited my office or will visit my office uh, once we're back at the San Diego Foundation, as soon as you sit down, you'll see one of my favorite quotes from Maya Angelou hanging on the wall. So I'll close by sharing another insightful wisdom from Maya Angelou that I think is so relevant for today. Maya once said, fear and hope cannot occupy the same space at the same time. Invite one in to stay. For all of us working on the San Diego COVID-19 Community Response Fund, we're fully committed to help nonprofits provide the bright light of hope that pushes the darkness of fear out the door for our neighbors and friends who are hurting through this crisis. So we're so glad to be with you. This is the first of more webinars to come. Uh, please give us your feedback and uh, we, we will improve this. And certainly with the noise background in my house, we're gonna eliminate that next time. But uh, again, so glad to be with you. And thanks for all that you're doing in our community. Goodbye.